Good afternoon and welcome to Wild Moments, brought to you by AFRICAM and powered by explore.org. This is a, a reboot of Thursday last week's show, hopefully without any glitches. Uh, the ones that we had last week made it impossible for us to broadcast, so here we are. My name is James Henry on Cape Town's, uh, looks like it's cold there too, <laughs> Cape Town's coast, we've got Russell Gerber in a beautiful beanie. Uh, I'm not wearing a beanie at the moment, although it's got cold enough in Johannesburg for that to be the case. <laughs> Hello, Russell. Hi, James. Yeah, I have to try to keep up with my Cape Townian stylish brethren, you know. Sometimes you've got to bring some color yes. into your life. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, it's cold, man. Yeah, it's getting cold down here already. Our first real taste mm. of winter, I reckon. Um, yeah. So I'm not used to it just yet. No, we've got an, we've got three months now uh, up in Johannesburg of staring at very clear uh, yet crisp skies, incredibly dry dry weather, and unfortunately people do burn things to stay warm in this part of the world, and so we'll be inhaling air that has got very little oxygen in it. I suppose down there you'll be inhaling air that's got a lot of rain in it. <laughs> yes. Rain and damp is uh, synonymous with Cape Town winter, so let's hope so. We always need rain. That it is. Yes, I suppose you do need the rain. All right, uh, let us move along swiftly. Quick few greetings from James Richard. Hello, James. You say congr congratulations on reaching some baby news. Yes, James, thank you very much. Uh, we haven't got the baby yet. Certainly it is in utero. Thank you. Uh, Gemma, hello. Rolling Trouble, hello. Uh, and OMG23, hello from Bob in Kalamazoo. Now, uh, we're going to sort of carry on with where we left off on Thursday, and then we'll circle back to the leopard clip that we showed first off last week. Um, we're just going to move on from there and see if we have time to redo that clip. I think we probably will towards the end. Good. All right, let's have the first clip. Now what we have here is a young male leopard and you might be wondering what he's doing and I think I'm just going to tell you straight away because he takes his time over what he's doing. He is stalking a troop of baboons that are sitting up a jackalberry tree. Now you can see he's a young male leopard from the evidence of the golden orbs behind his tail there. And this is a fairly typical behavior for young male leopards. They are the ones that tend to go after baboons, certainly in this part of the world. Uh, there are lots and lots of other options for them, and baboons are therefore quite a dangerous thing for them to go after. A big male baboon's got bigger teeth than this young male. Uh, he's obviously got friends, and he's also probably a little bit heavier than this young male leopard. So he'll be going for a youngster or a female. And I don't know if you've ever heard a leopard climb a tree, but they do make a bit of noise. They make a kind of scraping noise. And I think that sound is being masked by the breeze and the night sounds there. This is on the banks of the Olifant River. Very patient kitty as he thinks about going up the tree in his best approach to finding a meal. <laughs> that, that didn't go, that really didn't go according to plan. And he's going to sleep. <laughs> I think he could he could use a meal. Uh, I oh, the reason yeah. I'm laughing is that I'm imagining exactly what level of and kind of invective those baboons are throwing that cat's way. <laughs> and if we could speak baboon, uh, and if the camera could understand baboon, I suspect it would just be a long line of beeps. <laughs> Yeah, I think that we were chatting about it before the show. I think that's our young boy that we saw trying to uh, trying to catch fish uh, at Rosie's a while uh, back. Um, 
And uh, he, yeah, he's, he's given us quite a few fun shows of exploring the world of hunting for a, for a young leopard, as you say, James. And uh, I've actually, again, it's not something I've, I've seen a youngster do before. I've, I've only I've ever seen a leopard actually take a, a baboon once. I don't, have, you, have you actually seen it happen before? I've, I've never seen them take one. I've seen two or three young males with baboons in trees, almost always young okay. baboons. Yeah, the one I, the one I saw was also a young one, um, and again, I didn't actually see the kill. Same story. I saw the just the baboon, but that was the only time. The, any, everything else has always been, you know, little yeah. antelope and other small things. But mm. man, that <laughs> that leopard got the fright of his life. As did I. I have to be honest. I didn't realize it was going to be so loud that uh, those baboons, as the as you say, as the claw marks and claw sound that they heard, and that was it. I, I suspect that uh, anybody watching with pets have now got some very agitated animals knocking about their feet. Um, yeah, I, it's a strange thing. We were always taught as youngsters, I mean, this is before I knew anything about the bush, that baboons, one of their greatest threats is leopards. And I, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but my impression is that in your part of the world, that tends to be the case more you know, in the in the Cedarburg and those sorts of places, is that true, or am I am I incorrect? Again, I mean, the amount of times that I've heard about it or, or actually seen it happen, I've never seen that happen down in the Cape. You know, it's uh, yeah. in theory, but again, for the most part, Cape leopards, as they're often referred to, you know, tend to be a lot smaller than our yeah. our leopards up in the north and. And as you say, the baboons are are huge here. It would be a very risky thing yeah. for them to to take on. Um, yeah. So, ag agreed. You know, so when I started guiding, that was that was the story. The you know the yeah. mortal enemies, baboons and and leopards. But yeah. to be truthful, I just don't. You don't see them really taking taking the no. baboons on often. No, and I mean a big male baboon weighs in the region of what seventy kilos, I think. And yeah. I mean, a, yeah, a female leopard in the low felt where they're quite big averages around about probably 45, maybe 50. A huge female might be 50 kilos. And so to take on a big male baboon with teeth twice the size and that sort of strength, they're just so many more easy options. And so I'm not sure where this legend comes from, but I think it's garbage just about everywhere you go. I don't. I cannot see a situation where a baboon, at least where a leopard, other than these young males who take chances, would willingly take on a baboon. You don't see older male leopards doing it. You definitely don't see females doing it. And you, interestingly, don't see young females doing it. They tend to wise up before the young males. Yeah, definitely not. That was a cool clip, though, as you say. Not, not yeah. something I've, I've actually got to watch before. And the way that he... <laughs> Hightailed it out of that tree, really. I also burst out laughing. And they were yelling at him. They were so angry. They were so deeply irritated that their sleep had been disturbed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Like I say, the invective must have been profound. James Richard, you say <laughs> that hunt was certainly, in inverted commas, an epic fail. I would agree. I would say that was an epic fail. Rolling trouble, you say your dog freaked out. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> especially coming from the United States of America, where I don't suppose you have a lot of baboons knocking about outside your window. The dog must have been very confused. Anna, do we think that the young leopard would dare go back and try again? Uh, well, yes, apparently it did uh, a couple of days later, and certainly it didn't have, any, didn't have any success, I don't think, the second time. And any more questions about this? Uh, Judy H says, yikes. Yes, that's exactly what I thought, uh, I'm afraid, as that baboon started screaming. Thankfully, I'd seen that clip before. We don't normally. Um, but Russell, you hadn't seen it before, and so you went a little bit, you got a bit of a fright. I did, and I had my volume on quite loud here, so it <laughs> <laughs> really did uh, make me jump. I'm not going not gonna to lie. All right, let's move on from the poor male leopard who probably had to move on to a couple of small fish or some termites and see what else we have. Right, now, this 
was, uh, and this very seldom happens, but this was incorrectly identified by our viewers, by some viewers, not all, as a, what was it? Hang on a second. A slaty egret. A slaty egret, that's right. Mm. Just checking that out. Slaty egret. Now, the slaty egret, we will tell you what it is. It's not a slaty egret. The slaty egret is actually only found up in Botswana, in the Okavango Delta, and those sorts of surrounds. And this bird is, is found up there as well, but is also found in parts of South Africa. And many of you will have seen this bird on that rather classic uh, BBC clip of daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime. <laughs> and it, it is, of course, the black heron. And it was seen at the Compass Riss camera in the Northern Cape of South Africa. And for those of you who don't know, uh, what they do is they create this sort of shadow around themselves with their wings. And that seems to attract the animals or the fish and the frogs that they like to hunt. I suspect largely in they probably seek cover underneath the shadow and then the bird nails them. I can't think it's a massively successful strategy given that I think it is the only bird in the world that does that. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I've never seen it on another bird. Um, no. And we always get asked about it, you know, why, why do they do it? Is it so successful, yeah. this little foraging umbrella? But uh, I, I'm not convinced. You know, as you see, this, no. this chap is not, not interested in doing that. He's, he's just going forth the usual way. Um, I wonder if that isn't because there's no sun. Yeah, yeah maybe. Like it's cloudy, just a bit cloudy. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. No. And maybe the maybe. fish and frogs he's after wouldn't want any shade. I can't think there are too many fish in that particular area, too. I mean, I think that's in a pan or a, little, a fairly shallow dam, right? Um, no, it is very shallow. So I don't think yeah. there's much there. Yeah. There won't be a huge number of bream sort of swimming around in enormous uh, in enormous schools so we're looking at a black heron there in case you were wondering can we go back to the bird i'm just going to go through a couple of the diagnostic features that one should look for when comparing them other than the distribution that always especially to novice birders is the first thing you must look at does the bird actually occur where i'm seeing it it's not to say that you won't find a vagrant but in this particular case it's not a vagrant and the slaty egret is not found anywhere near where this bird is. Uh, I'll just read from you, read to you from the Roberts Bird app. Similar to slaty egret, but darker, lacking rufous buff throat stripe. Eyes always dark and legs all black. Also regularly mantles over the water in umbrella formation, which the slaty never does. So there we go. So by remember, it says black legs. It doesn't make mention of the feet. This particular heron has got beautiful yellow shoes. <laughs> Gorgeous yellow shoes. Mm. Yes, and the slaty doesn't have that, I believe. No. No, I don't think the slaty has yellow shoes. The slaty's got yellow legs all the way yes. down. Or certainly, yeah, pretty much. Just to, from just above the tarsal. So. Very nice black egret that we have. Sorry, black heron. <laughs> Can't combine the two birds. Uh, very nice I think black it used heron. To be egret, I feel like it used to be I egret. Think it was. Yes, I think it was. Uh, it's yeah. yeah I mean, these names changed quite a long time ago, but I still find myself stuck um, saying, "Well, you know, it's a new name. It's not new anymore, James. It's about twenty-two <laughs> years old." I think those names. Well, you names see, are, we're but, showing up. Yeah. Showing our age, James. We're toothless exactly. lions now, you know. We, we, we don't remember these things. <laughs> <laughs> so zygote, you say, is it a black heron or an egret? It's a black heron. I had to check again. Um, <laughs> Zet, those big male babs is scary. Oh, sorry, we're talking about the baboons there. Um, walking on their hind legs makes a big male taller than the average woman. Yes, or a short man, such as me. Um, 
Right, so we'll go back to the bird now. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen that daytime, nighttime, nighttime, nighttime uh, clip, go and just YouTube it. Uh, really fascinating and rather amusing. Did you say yellow feet was good identification? It is. It's a good identification marker. No doubt there. Sometimes there's doubt. This time there is no doubt. Kathy, you say, why isn't it called a blue heron? A blue heron? I, I don't know. I am not part of any international ornithological nomenclatural society, so I couldn't tell you, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think it's very blue. I think it's pretty, it's pretty black, blacky grey. Um, it, it certainly is bluish. I'll give you that. It's bluish. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, why it's, it's got a, a blue bluish hue. I would say more bluish grey. <laughs> yeah, it's not black though. You make a good point. Uh, I don't know, Kathy. You know, I often would like to meet the people who give the birds their names and um well slap them upside the head sometimes because the, some of the names they give birds are completely ridiculous and my personal favorite is the black collared barbet uh, which has an enormously bright red face why it's <laughs> named for the black collar i am not sure anyway the green wood hoopoo is another great example used to be called the red billed wood hoopoo because it's got a yes. big long red bill and unless you see it in the brightest sunshine, there's nothing green about it. So that's a dreadful name. So if, if you happen to be part of the International Ornithological Society, please use your, into, use your common sense. That would be great. It would help all of us very much. I'll okay. Just check in here, yes. James. There is actually a great blue heron, apparently, ah. as well. Yes. It, not it, here. It is a no. North American and Central American okay. bird. So, Kathy, there is a great blue heron. And often, I mean, I'm being quite sarcastic and facetious about these names. Often the reason they do change them is because they are either called the same species is called different things in different regions, or as perhaps in this case, there is a blue heron already. It's not the same as the black heron, but there is already a blue heron or a great blue heron uh, in another part of the world. Thank you. It is a big much. issue, and you've just been down at the coast, I know. Um, for yeah. a, I'm sure you whipped out the old fishing rod, but fish is a huge one. You know that people yeah. are always arguing about what a fish is because the name, literally in one country, you can have mm. three or four different names. Certainly in South Africa, where yeah. people are calling the same fish by by many different names according to local um, mm. knowledge. Um, so it it gets really confusing. So it yeah. it is. It is a difficult thing to get around, but obviously, unless we all went about using the scientific name for every species. Yeah. That is that is the solution <laughs> to learn the Latin. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, it's not a nice solution, but it is a solution. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I all can right. bring myself to do it, no. to be honest. No, I know I can't. <laughs> Let's move on to the next clip, please. My dear, I'm talking to my wife, by the way. Uh, right, here we have, oh, this beastly python. Hi, Tom. Uh, another one. <laughs> another bird bites another. the dust. <laughs> I think another red bull hornbill, it looks yeah, like. With that's friend, right. A couple of friends nearby. A couple of friends flying around saying, where did Alan go? <laughs> oh, Alan's in the jaws of a snake. Quite nice about this clip here. I mean, other than the death, I mean, let's give exactly three seconds silence to the death of the red billed hornbill. There we go. Very well, uh, what's interesting here is the what I think are Cape Glossy starlings, and a whole flock of them has come in here, and they're now alarm calling and bombing this python. And what's fascinating to me is that they weren't doing that when he was on the log, which indicates that they didn't know he was there, that they were equally yeah. oblivious to him while he was there. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen him a few times now when, you know, making these little kills. Again, not one other bird alarming in any way 
until yeah. until it actually happens. Um, and he's been using the same spot for months now, as we know. Yeah. Um, but if you just hang out long enough and you're patient enough, yeah. you know, even the birds seem to forget that anything's even there. So that's why he's still I having really, success. Yeah. I've been reading a little bit about bird vision and um, a wonderful book called Bird Sense, which is sort of helps a human being try to understand what it's like to sense the world as a bird. So we've been looking at the bird's eyes at the moment. And diurnal birds like that are, have very poor night vision, but they should have sort of um, visual acuity roughly two to four times as good as our own. And it just shows you how brilliant the camouflage of that snake is because that picture should in theory be clearer to those birds than it is to us and i mean we know the snakes there and so it's very difficult to sort of remove yourself from that situation look at the picture and not see the snake but it is interesting to me that it seems obvious to us because we're looking at it uh, we know he's there uh, but for these birds which have better eyes than us in this bright light they're still not seeing him and i think it's just a testament to his fantastic camouflage when you were checking it out did, how do they see color do they see it as well as us or primates or I, I don't recall yes, that they actually see it better they've well, they got do. um four well, not all birds, but um, certainly the diurnal ones um, have got four, you know, we see in three color spectrums. We see in red, green, and blue. Mm -hmm. They see red, green, and blue, and a lot of species see ultraviolet as well. So, yes. you know, a, a, for the starlings, that's what looks, that looks like a virtual starling. They will look totally different to each other than they look to us because of their ability to see ultraviolet and the amount of reflected ultraviolet that will come off those iridescent uh, feathers so in theory they sh should be able to see that snake i suppose um but maybe difficult when they're coming down to land i don't know the other fascinating thing which has got nothing to do with this clip but i i, I find it so fascinating i have to share it is that birds like that hornbill which have eyes on either side of the head apparently are eye dominant uh, in one way and they use one eye for close stuff and they use one eye for looking out for predators and apparently this is easiest seen on a duck or on a, a, a chicken a newborn chicken and what they do is they from the time they're born they will feed sort of with a head slightly to the side and the one eye is used for looking for predators and the other eye is used for looking used yeah for looking for food and so they have this ability to kind of form two pictures of different focal lengths in the mind at the same time which uh, i mean maybe some people know that i didn't know that and i thought it was absolutely astounding no i didn't know that 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 is amazing and yeah. i was wondering about the color because there, there was a great show not long ago about uh, about color life and color, another bbc thing yeah. i think as well um and uh it just showed how remarkable it was when you took certain mm. hues out of the color spectrum and how difficult yes. things became to see. I know they were yeah. using tiger in that particular example of why, yes. you know, how, how is an orange tiger so camouflaged? And, and of course, they show beautifully how that orange color disappears mm. because of the um, spectrum that they're bracing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and that they... Yeah. you know almost completely disappear but like you said it's surprising to me that they haven't spotted that snake you know, after all know. this time and they still yeah. haven't so no um i mean the other thing with that color would in an african example what always used to astound me uh, before i understood the eyes a little bit better is that something like a steenbok or an impala to us against a bright spring green background is incredibly obvious there's nothing camouflaged about it uh, but if you don't see red which the predators don't they see in blue and green you know it just kind of disappears a bit it must be a lot more difficult for them to see i suppose yeah fascinating here from james richard who says there's also evidence that primates like us are particularly good at recognizing snakes compared to other animals 
I, yeah, I mean, I suppose that's that's actually really interesting. That would make a lot of sense. Right. And Katia, you say, we'll soon have no red talk talks left. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Um, I hope that we will have some, but maybe not in that area. <laughs> All righty, let's move on. Here we are, we're circling back to that we had on Thursday last week when our technical glitches prevented us having the show. And this is just a quick update on the Rosie's Pan female and what Russell and I think is her female cub. <laughs> yeah, I still stand by it. I think uh, yeah. I still think it's a girl. I do too. I think we it was on Thursday we were saying that she just doesn't have the stockiness of a young male. She's got that sort of lithe stringiness of the lung of the young female, I think. Yeah, and for me the the head, you know, not quite yes. as chunky as as the mm. as the boys. Especially, as I say, if you, we spoke about if you see them next to each other, where you often mm. do have a male and female cub in one litter. <laughs> One's a little nervous <laughs> of the herons. <laughs> but uh, you could see it. But yeah, I still think it's a, a little girl. I think chunky is a very good way of describing it, actually. The males are just a little bit more chunky. And obviously, they'll get a lot more chunky as they get bigger. But even from this age, yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that with leopards, you know, that mm. uh, and a lot of our big cats that the the boys are much bigger than the girls, yeah. you know, almost double from, in some yeah. cases, you know. Um, and from quite early on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it it does become easier to ID them as they as they get mm. to I don't know what about about 6 months and then yeah. then it gets much easier. Yeah. And then I would have said that's right. Yeah, from probably just under 6 months. It's actually, if you've got two cubs uh, and they're siblings, it's pretty easy to tell them apart. If yeah, next from to earlier, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, that's the update on the Rosie's Pan female. We have a few minutes left if anybody would like to fling us a question. Otherwise, I suppose I'll just stare at the camera and uh, mumble at you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know, I know we spoke about last last week that we were just happy to see the cub. You know, we we, yes. we chatted briefly about how how difficult a time it is for them. Mm. You know, leading in that first six months That's um, right. yeah. of their life, and how how you know how bad things can go. Um, and that I had had a horrific sighting of seeing uh, cubs yes. being killed by another female. Mm. Um, on a trip with guests that we had watched for hours um, on a on two drives in a row, and then the next day we came around and found these two cubs mm. um, killed, and um, and how you know how distressing it was uh, to mm. see. I mean, it's it's a funny thing. It's something I'll never really understand. Um, maybe because we are, I guess, naturally predators, but how we always tend to root for. The predators to catch yeah. <laughs> poor impala or uh, you know steenbok whatever it might yes. be, and yet whenever a predator gets killed, it feels a lot more distressing. I wonder why that is. Uh, I think we just attach ourselves more to the to the cats, but you know it doesn't apply with crocodiles. Nobody ever wants a crocodile to kill anything. Uh, I remember <laughs> you know the Mara. No one roots for the crocodile when the wildebeest are crossing. <laughs> Everyone wants the crocodile to go hungry. Yeah, and that's true. It's also it's also quite interesting. I think if you've ever watched a kill happen, um, how with guests, how the guests will, you know, they'll often say, "Well, you know, we'd love to see a kill if if it's possible," and you'll <laughs> say, "Well, are you sure you really want to see a kill? Because mm -hmm. it can be fairly distressing." And then the poor little diker or steenbok gets nailed and it lets out that one plaintive bleat before it's throttled yeah and that's the last kill that many people want to see and suddenly um people do start kind of rooting for the prey absolutely yeah I, I, many many times i think 
most people most people when they do see it go down feel like wow this is not not what i expected yeah. um particularly bigger prey you know the, mm. the big thing like buffalo or giraffe or uh, even wildebeest i think is one mm. that i've seen too many times that doesn't doesn't give up easy you know so it can no. be half an hour yeah. that you're sitting there while yeah. while it all goes down yeah no, it's, it's a beautiful thing to watch watch right thank you everybody uh russell and i are finally going off on safari over the course of the next week we're both very excited about that there we go <laughs> and so <laughs> next week wild moments will be hosted by the great trishala naidu and she'll be born joined born she'll be joined i've got babies on the brain she'll be joined <laughs> by the great tristan dix and they will be discussing the highlights from the wild <laughs> they'll be let me say that again they'll be discussing the highlights from the africam wild cameras okay so that's it from wild moments brought to you by explore.org We'll see you when we get back. Bye-bye.